so I, I think it's fair to say that the most important theoretical tool in I.O. Uh, has been game theory. Uh, it's interesting to look at uh, game theory as used by economists because up until the 1970s, although of course game theory was known well before then, uh, it wasn't used very much in the core of economics. Um, I uh, had my first job at MIT starting in 1977 and I believe I taught the first game theory course at the graduate level uh, in the economics department that had ever been laid on. So game theory was very much a peripheral subject at that time, but starting in about the mid-70s, mainly because of I.O., game theory grew to be a major tool within all of economics. So it was first I.O. Uh, and then uh, by the 1990s it, it was used practically everywhere. Uh, game theory had been used a little bit in economics before the 70s, in particular uh, the nice connection between the core and competitive equilibria was something that was explored extensively in the 60s. Uh, but it was certainly not used as a foundation for empirical work until much later. So one question to ask is uh, why game theory became so important uh, in I.O and why it continues to be important. Uh, there are certain situations which can be explored pretty satisfactorily without game theory, uh, but they're limited. Uh, one is perfect competition. That's one extreme of the spectrum. The other is monopoly. And basically everything else in between it falls under the heading of game theory. Now, in perfect competition, where we have lots of small sellers and lots of small buyers, the idea is that each individual agent doesn't have much effect on the market as a whole. So in particular, no agent can affect prices ap appreciably. Uh, and that fact, the fact that all the agents are small, simplifies matters dramatically. You might have thought that because there are lots of agents around that, that the analysis is going to be very complicated, but it is actually simplified by the large numbers because if, if I'm a seller and I'm thinking about what to do, I know that my behavior is not going to affect other sellers appreciably. And so when I'm choosing my behavior, I of course have to make some prediction about what they're going to do. Because I don't affect them, I don't have to think about what they're going to anticipate from me because their anticipations about me are irrelevant to their own behavior. And that means that I don't have to behave strategically. And that's why perfectly competitive markets are so easy, relatively speaking, to analyze. At the opposite extreme, uh, there's monopoly, uh, where there's just one seller uh, and just as in perfect competition, that seller doesn't have to worry about what other sellers are going to do because there aren't any other sellers. So monopoly and perfect competition are just fine without game theory, but the intermediate case, 
where there's more than one seller, but these sellers are not small, is harder. Uh, yes. That's right. So there's monopolistic competition. Um, actually, monopolistic competition goes back to Chamberlain and Robinson. Uh, and that's, that's right. That's not perfect competition. But yet, s sellers are small enough not to have uh, appreciable effect on others. When I, when I talk about uh, the the two extremes, perfect competition and, and monopoly, uh, that's a very rough uh, statement, and you're right, that there are uh, a few other exceptions like monopolistic competition, absolutely. But let's think of an industry where uh, there are only a few sellers, or at least only a few sellers uh, that have a big effect. Uh, the, uh, the breakfast cereal industry in the U.S. Uh, has been such an example. Uh, if I've got this right, there are uh, basically two big players in that, in that industry. There's uh, Kellogg's and there's General Mills. And the, the point is that when Kellogg's is figuring out what it's going to do, which cereals it's going to produce, uh, how many units of each uh, to sell, what prices to set. It has to make some guesses about what General Mills will do and, and vice versa. And so now strategic interaction becomes important and potentially very complicated because uh, when, when firm A is predicting what firm B is going to do, well, in order to make that prediction, firm A, in principle, has to anticipate what B anticipates A is going to do. And it goes further than that. It also has to anticipate what B anticipates A anticipates B will do and so on. In fact, there, there are, uh, there's an infinite sequence of possible anticipations that have to be taken into account for, a, for an oligopolistic firm to predict uh, an optimal strategy. Now, a breakthrough and uh, a, uh, a, theoret a theoretical breakthrough uh, in this direction was the development by John Nash of what we now call Nash equilibrium. Na Nash called it an equilibrium point uh, because a Nash equilibrium cuts through the potentially infinite sequence of anticipations. It looks for a fixed point in anticipations. Uh, and I'm sure you, you all know what a Nash equilibrium is, but just to fix ideas, uh, if we have a, a game in strategic or normal form, which uh, takes strategies into payoffs, uh, then a Nash equilibrium is just an n-tuple of strategies, one for each player, such that no player raises its payoff by deviating unilaterally. So if it changes its strategy, the other players are using their equilibrium strategies, player I's payoff doesn't go up. So Nash equilibrium was the concept that made uh, the application of game theory to I.O. possible. Now, uh, there, there nonetheless were a number of precursors to Nash, uh, and I'm going to mention 
five of them here because uh, those five will be uh, developed in their contemporary guises uh, in the lecture I'm, I'm planning to give next week. Uh, so you're probably familiar with at least some of these. One is, uh, is Cournot duopoly from the early 19th century. So, so this was well before uh, modern economics. Uh, Cournot was interested in a pair of firms uh, who are definitely in the same industry. They're basically producing the same kind of good. Uh, and each chooses as its strategy a quantity to produce. And because they are producing the same good, it's the, it's the sum of the quantities that determines the price. So, so this is inverse demand. Price is a function of total industry output. Each firm presumably has to incur some cost for uh, producing its outputs. And then a firm's payoff, or its net profit, is just price times quantity minus cost. And a Corno equilibrium uh, is just a Nash equilibrium in quantity. So, so Cournot perfectly anticipated the general concept of Nash equilibrium uh, more, than a, more than a century earlier. Then there is Bertrand, uh, Bertrand duopoly. Uh, actually, before I get to that, you've been relatively quiet so far, so either this is too familiar to ask about or you're, you're still not awake. I can't believe it's because it's, uh, it's all so engrossing. You can't think of anything to say. Yeah, very good. <laughs> So at a Nash equilibrium, if the equilibrium strategies are common knowledge, then uh, it's player one will anticipate player two will be using S2 star. Player two will anticipate that one is going to use S1 star. Player one will anticipate that two anticipates that one will use S1 star, and so on. Well, it, uh, the equilibrium doesn't have to be unique, but players have to know which equilibrium is being played. That's right. Uh, hmm? <laughs> there, so multiple equilibria can create difficulties, and I think there will be discussion later on. Uh, but as, as long as people know which equilibrium is being played, then, uh, then we're OK. So Bertrand duopoly came about because uh, Bertrand was looking at Cournot's work. Uh, and the Bertrand model emerged in a critique that Bertrand was writing uh, on the Cournot model. Uh, Bertrand looked at basically the same setup that Cournot did. It, it, it's still two firms. They're still producing goods that are exact substitutes for one another, except that now the strategic variable is price rather than quantity. So each firm chooses a price. Uh, now uh, 
depending on the two prices that are chosen, uh, a, a firm I faces demand. Uh, and this is the form of firm I's demand. If, if firm I is choosing the lower of the two prices, well then presumably all consumers go to that firm. So, so the firm gets the entire market demand. If firm I is choosing the higher price, all consumers go to the other firm. So firm I now has zero demand. Uh, in the case where they're both charging the same price, well, they split the demand. They each get half of the market demand. So that, that was the Bertrand setup. And equilibrium, uh, as before, is a Nash equilibrium, but now it's a Nash equilibrium uh, in prices. And one uh, interesting point to make is that if the two firms happen to be identical, which, which means that their cost functions are the same, and if uh, the cost function takes the form of a constant marginal cost, then in equilibrium, um, firms will be setting a price equal to marginal cost, which, which is notable because that's also uh, the outcome of perfect competition. So, uh, interestingly, with only two firms, firms which you would have thought might have considerable market power, we get, uh, we get perfect competition uh, even in that setting. Now, that's a strong conclusion, uh, but of course the, the assumptions behind it are pretty strong, and uh, those assumptions were then challenged by Edgeworth, who, uh, who noted that one, one important feature of the Bertrand model is that uh, Firms could produce uh, any quantities they like. Uh, I I in the last result where we got perfect competition, uh, a firm could produce uh, any quantity uh, at the same constant marginal cost. Uh, Ber Bertrand noted that, well, perhaps uh, would be more re re it would be more realistic to assume that production capacities are limited, that you can produce up to a certain amount, but not beyond that. And he was interested in exploring that implication. Uh, now, with limited capacities, it may not be the case that the firm setting the lower price gets all the demand because perhaps that firm can't supply all the demand, in which case the other firm is going to get some demand too. And that means uh, two things. First, uh, there may not be uh, a Nash equilibrium anymore, at least it, there may not be a Nash equilibrium in uh, in pure strategies, uh, and more, particu uh, more particularly, if capacities are, are small enough, uh, we're not going to get perfect competition in equilibrium anymore, because imagine, imagine that uh, the two firms were setting price equal to marginal cost, now, it's going, to, it's going to pay one of the firms to raise its price. Why? Because if it raises its price, the other firm is not going to be able to supply the entire market. Uh, 
at marginal cost. So some of the demand will go to the firm that's charging the higher price. And furthermore, that higher price earns the firm a profit because it's above marginal cost. So, so we can't have price equals marginal cost in equilibrium anymore. Now what Bertrand proposed, as, sorry, what Edgeworth proposed as the resolution to this problem is what he called an Edgeworth cycle. He didn't think about mixed strategies. He thought about a dynamic model in which uh, firms might start with prices above marginal cost, but then they would have an incentive to undercut one another to get more market share. At some point, uh, they wouldn't continue the price war any longer. One of the firms would uh, raise its price, and Edgeworth anticipated that this uh, cycle of price war followed by uh, a price relenting phase uh, would, would continue indefinitely. One of the things that I want to do uh, in the lecture next week is to look at a contemporary treatment of this old Edgeworth cycle idea, a, a fully game theoretic uh, treatment of Edgeworth cycles. Now, Krebs and Schenkman took another approach to the idea of limited capacity. Uh, they they, they uh, accepted Edgeworth's idea that that there might that firms might uh, not be able to produce indefinite quantities. So they said, well, suppose that uh, firms did have limited capacities, uh, and that they and that they chose these capacities. That that is, they installed capacity at a cost, uh, and they imagined a a two-stage game in which first capacities are chosen uh, and then there's competition in prices a la Bertrand. So you, uh, conceptually they, they thought of capacities as something that are chosen infrequently or, and that capacities persist uh, over time uh, prices are the way that firms compete in the, in the short run. And what they found, at least under certain uh, assumptions, is that the equilibrium of this two-stage game, or more precisely the sub-game sub perfect equilibrium of this two-stage game, uh, entails firms choosing capacities which are actually equal to the Cournot quantities in the one-shot Cournot game. So this, this was a way of bringing Cournot and Bertrand together uh, in a single model. Uh, the, the Cournot turns out to be the reduced form of a game in which capacities are chosen for the longer term, prices are chosen for the short term. And we will come back to Krebs and Schenkman uh, in this lecture next week. Another departure from Cournot was the Stackelberg model uh, of 1934. So Stackelberg, uh, like Edgeworth, was interested in dynamic competition, competition that occurs uh, over time. And he looked at a very simple version of this in which there are two firms, think of them as Cournot firms producing the same kind of output, but they don't move simultaneously. First one firm moves and 
chooses a quantity, and then the other firm moves reacting to what the first firm did. But in all other respects, the, the uh, Stackelberg model is the same uh, as the Cournot model. And what Stackelberg uh, noted is that there's an advantage when firms are choosing quantities to moving first. So the Stackelberg leader, the, fir the, the firm to move first, will have a higher output and a higher profit than the firm that moves second. Uh, just the opposite turns out to be true if the firms were competing in prices. Uh, but this idea that in some circumstances being a leader, getting to move first, gives you an advantage is again uh, an idea that we will be returning to uh, in the lecture next week. And then the final Nash precursor that I want to mention, uh, there are others, but uh, I'm talking about precursors that I want to build on in next week's lecture, uh, is the idea of a, of a kink demand curve. Uh, to be found in work by Hall and Hitch and Sweezy. Uh, and this also uh, is essentially a dynamic uh, oligopoly concept, although these two early treatments looked at the issue in a, in a purely static model. Uh, so Under the kink demand curve, unlike the Bertrand model, uh, we can have an equilibrium where price is above marginal cost. And the reason for this is that if one of the firms contemplates lowering its price, undercutting the other firm, and trying to take market share away from that other firm, it anticipates that the other firm will respond to that by cutting its price too. And so, uh, yes, uh, you can very temporarily get a bigger market by cutting your price, but that will quickly uh, be negated by the other firm cutting its price. And so uh, in the end, you're going to be worse off because you'll still be splitting the market with the other firm, but now at a lower price than before. So you don't want to lower your price, but you also don't want to raise your price because you anticipate that the other firm is not going to follow that. And so the other firm will now have a lower price than you and will get most of the market. So that means that the, uh, let me see if there's any chalk. That means that the demand curve is going to look something like this. If you raise the price, demand is going to drop away very quickly. If you lower the price, you're going to have to share the market with the other firm. There's, a, there's in effect a kink in the demand curve. Well, the early papers on this subject, the early 20th century papers on this subject, uh, got the idea across conceptually, but not surprisingly, because they didn't have the game theory tools, they didn't have a, uh, uh, a full-fledged analysis of this. And one of the things we'll be doing next week is to see how this works in a properly dynamic model. Yes? So this kink is specific to a, some specific price, or this then this kink is like, if you think that it, it is a 
possible to any private? Well, a uh, uh, very good question. So it, uh, we'll see in the dynamic model of next week that, there, that there's a range of prices for which a kink is possible. So, so the kink demand curve concept does not pin down which price it's going to be, uh, but it does pin down a range of prices. Not all prices can, can uh, serve as the equilibrium of a kink demand curve equilibrium. And, we, and we'll see which ones are possible. Fails, a absolutely. That's right. So, so thi this this uh, intuition will work for prices of an intermediate sort. That's right. If they if they if they if they're too high, you're going to want to cut the price. If they're too low, you're going to want to raise the price. Okay. Now, all of the early papers that I was just talking about were known to economists uh, even before the game theory revolution. If you look at textbooks from the 1960s, they mention Bertrand, they mention Cournot, and so on. But it's, it's fair to say that economics and I.O. specifically were not very much affected by by these early works. Did, did you have a question? Yeah, just a lot of curiosity. When was the Bertrand with differentiated products introduced? Uh, early 20th century. Yeah, so that, that was also quite, quite early. <laughs> So these are five precursors that I am going to build on. I'm not saying that they're, they're only ones. Uh, you're right. There, there are others, such as hotel. Hoteling was a game theoretic model. Again, he didn't get the game theory quite right, and that was later corrected by, uh, by Thies and, uh, and others. But, uh, and, and there are other early authors I could have mentioned, but these are the ones that we're going to see again next week. So you might, you might say, if, if these were important ideas, and, and I think they, they were important ideas, why didn't they go anywhere? And I, I think we can only speculate on that, but uh, uh, one thing that Nash did was to show that the idea of an equilibrium point, a Nash equilibrium, is actually a uh, a very general idea. Cournot, Bertrand, etc., had very specific models with lots of particular assumptions. Nash showed that the idea of an equilibrium point is something pervasive that can essentially apply to any game theoretic model. Um, and, that, and that generality played a large role in economists' thinking. But curiously, even when Nash uh, published, his work didn't have very much effect on economics for another 20 or 25 years. Uh, wasn't in, uh, Nash was published in 1950. We didn't see a lot of game theory in I.O. or any place else uh, until mid 70s. And again, uh, we'd have to do a counterfactual analysis to understand just why that was, but um, my explanation is that it was a, at about that time that economists started getting interested in 
a number of dynamic issues and also a number of issues involving incomplete in information. And it just so happens that the successors to Nash, Harsanyi, Zelton, Alman, Shapley, had developed just the right game theoretic tools to analyze these uh, more complicated dynamic issues, which were, which were uh, intellectually challenging. Uh, and so starting in the 70s, we saw many, many papers on tacit collusion and dynamic models, entry deterrence, uh, and many others. Uh, and I, I'm going to talk about some of these models next week. Uh, now, one funny thing that happened in I.O. <coughs> was that the theory got way ahead of the empirical side. So all of this work being done in the 70s and pretty much through the 80s was uh, purely theoretical uh, to the point where when, uh, when Jean Tirol published his I.O. book, which is still being used today, this was in the late 80s, it consisted of theory because the empirical people hadn't really caught up. Now they did, of course, start catching up, but that wasn't until the 1990s. Uh, and these days, I, I think it, it might be fairly said that the empirical side is ahead of the, of the theory. The, 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 these days you see much more empirical work in I.O. than in theory. And that's why uh, for, this, for this summer school, although the summer school is traditionally uh, a, an economic theory venue, uh, Ariel and I thought it would be most appropriate if we had a, a nice balance between theory uh, and empirical work, and that's what we have planned for you. And now to introduce the empirical side, let me turn things over to Ariel. Thank you. <laughs>